Welcome to the Mediation Africa Forum, a virtual series hosted by Wasiliana Hub. Ladies and gentlemen, today is the 15th day of October 2020. I am your session moderator, Sarah Ater. Our event this uh, afternoon uh, is part of the quarter three uh, 2020 Mediation Day Symposium, where we are hosting three sessions. We already had the morning session at seven o'clock. This is the afternoon session running from two o'clock. And later on, we will have an evening session at four o'clock. We shall begin with the words of the national anthem. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. Ladies and gentlemen, this session is, is being recorded and will be availed on Wasiliana Hub uh, platforms. In converging the community of professional mediators in Kenya and in Africa, Wasiliana Hub hosts events both in person and virtual that are weekly, monthly, or quarterly mediation day symposium, as well as the annual strategy conference, now in its second year, and the African International Mediation Week, which kicks off in December 2020. All the events and discussions are aligned to the strategy 2020 theme, ADR Tomorrow for Africa, which is focused on positioning, policy and practice of mediation and dispute resolution. ADR Tomorrow for Africa is to reimagine, rewire and retool in positioning policy and practice so as to transform the dispute ecosystem. We therefore use ADR to mean appropriate, alternate and alternative. Wasiliana Hub is creating a society in which all people have access to use a neutral option in resolving conflict and the ability to achieve sustainable outcomes which enrich lives. Uh, the focus of our quarter three uh, symposium uh, today, the 15th day of October 2020, is the economics of dispute in Kenya. Uh, we shall be taken through this uh, particular session by uh, our guest speaker, Mr. John Ohaga. Mr. Ohaga is the managing partner and co-head of dispute resolution in the leading firm of Triple O K LLP Advocates. Mr. Ohaga sits on the board of the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, NCIA. He is a member of the Mediation Accreditation Committee he chairs the Accreditation Subcommittee and chairs the National Committee on the Formulation of the ADR Policy for Africa, uh, ADR Policy for Kenya. He is also the, the chairman of the Sports Disputes Tribunal. Uh, he chairs the Appeals uh, Committee of the Advertising Standards Board, has been the convener of the Law Society of Kenya Committee on Alternative Dispute Resolution for the last five years. He is a fellow of the Asian Institute of Alternative Dispute Resolution and uh, of the Harvard uh, Law School in Negotiation and Leadership. Good afternoon, Mr. Ohaga. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Sarah. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ohaga. Um, just before you take us through, uh, we will invite uh, one of our young mediators, uh, mediator Mohammed Said, to be able to give a brief commentary before we go into your talk. Uh, young mediator Mohammed, kindly.
Hello, how are you? Um, fine. Okay, uh, are you hearing me? Yes, Mohammed, please proceed. Okay, thanks, uh, Moderator Sarah, and also I would like to thank uh, our speaker, guest speaker, John M. Ohaga, for the wonderful topic. The economics of dispute resolution is cost the only factor. As uh, we understand that uh, economics is a, a social science uh, concerned with production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. And here you're talking about services because you're talking about dispute resolution, talk about legal matters. So we are concerned about services and the production, distribution, and consumption of those services. So here we look at uh, a compre comprehensive viewpoint of uh, the economics of uh, dispute resolution in Kenya, uh, whereby uh, the speaker will explain in details if I'm correct. I'm just trying to make an introduction to this topic, but he's more well versed. Uh, it starts with the bill, introduction of bill in parliament will influence how the bill will, will be written, how the judge will provide the verdict and other players that, like uh, lawyers and, uh, and technicality that, that are involved. So there are many factors apart from the cost. So to me, I, I disagree that uh, it is only cost. Cost is, on, is not the only factor. We have the cost is uh, one of the major factor, but also we have uh, other players uh, like uh, law firms in terms of litigations. And if you talk about uh, alternative dispute resolution, we have arbitrators, uh, mediators, and also there is a factor of time, like litigation takes a lot of time. Also there are technicalities, especially when talking about litigation. Uh, if you are not a, a legal personnel, it becomes very difficult to, to deal and to find your own way to attain the justice that you want. So uh, according to my understanding that uh, litigation is expensive, and even other, other alternative dispute resolution mechanism are also expensive, like uh, administration, adjudication. Uh, the mediation is fair and affordable. It takes less time. It, uh, it's less technical. And also the players, like uh, the, par the parties, they own the justice. So to me, in terms of economics of dispute resolution, uh, mediation is the way to go. So I'd like to hear more from the, the, the guest speaker. Uh, you get the insight on the topic, the depth, and uh, understanding it comprehensively. And this is just my brief understanding. And uh, I hope uh, uh, he will correct me where I, I got wrong. Thanks a lot, Moderator, Moderator Sarah. Thanks for giving me the, the chance. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, young mediator Mohammed, uh, for that uh, brief commentary. Uh, Mr. Ohaga, as you have heard him say, that uh, he would like to hear whether some of the things that he raised are actually uh, correct or not. So we are looking forward to hearing from you, learning from you, and engaging you. Uh, Kari Busana. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. I, I will try to um, give you a perspective that I hope um, will make sense to you when we are done with, with, the, with my discussion. Um, uh, before I start, I'd just like to introduce my, my dear wife who has joined us this afternoon. Uh, you will see on the forum she is joining us from London, where she's in quarantine. Uh, so Rupert, you should, you should consider yourself lucky that uh, you're here enjoying the sun while she's there <laughs> um, in, in, in the rain and, and cold. But um, <clears throat> she joined to give me support and to just listen to my views um, on this. She's a lawyer as well. Um, but one of the 
methodologies for dispute resolution that we agreed on was that she would not practice, so she doesn't practice. I practice. <laughs> Uh, and so when we need to resolve disputes, I go to her. Uh, so let me just, uh, I think it's, it's perhaps interesting to me that you chose this because we don't think about, um, as, as, as lawyers, I'm, I'm a lawyer, and as dispute resolvers, the economics of dispute resolution is not what comes to mind first and foremost. And so even though um, I did study economics at all level, at A levels, I beg your pardon, I had to go back to try and find a fitting definition of economics so that I could see how best um, it could fit into my discussion. And I found one that I, that, that I thought was um, short and apt. And it just said, economics is the study of mankind in the ordinary business of life. Uh, this is Alfred Marshall. And um, Lionel Robbins says, economics is the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. So economics really is about the distribution of resources um, in society to try and ensure that we cater, I think, um, for, for all of society in a way that meets uh, their needs. Dispute resolution, on the other hand, refers to the processes that we use to address, to address disputes. Uh, and I think this is what Mohammed was trying to say. There are different methodologies of dispute resolution. Um, and this depends from when the dispute arises, there's early resolution through to formal um, resolution processes, which ultimately end up with a court process. And as you know, as uh, mediators yourselves, uh, disputes can involve individuals, for instance, neighbors um, who have a shared fence and have a conflict as to whether the fence is on the proper beacon or not. Um, corporate entities who are doing business with each other or um, employ people and they have disputes in the employment relationship. And even government itself. Um, for instance, you find that um, we're challenging governmental decisions every day. And sometimes you find government entities um, in dispute with each other. So disputes cut across all of society. Now, how then do we try to handle disputes um, as people who are in control of economic production? First and foremost, we try to resolve the dispute ourselves. So if, if it is a simple dispute between you and your neighbor, Hopefully you would have the good sense to um, talk across the fence and try and resolve the dispute uh, so that it does not escalate beyond, um, beyond just yourselves. If that is not successful, then you might want to use a third party to help you to resolve the dispute. Uh, that third party might be a mediator, it might be an arbitrator, um, a conciliator, there are all these uh, methods of dispute resolution that you're all familiar with. Alternatively, you might want to resort to a process which is provided by government. Um, and those would essentially be our court structure. So a magistrate, a judge, a tribunal, um, an ombudsman in some cases. And that really is the, the spectrum of uh, dispute resolution processes available to us. Yes, certainly there are situations where an industry body may be able to facilitate the resolution of a dispute. So for instance, the Federation of Kenya Employers might assist um, employers to resolve disputes or might train them, or a chamber of commerce might resolve disputes between its members in order to facilitate trade. Um, but those are internal to them. So in terms of 
just the escalation of dispute resolution, I would say they self, then there is a third party, and depending on the nature of the dispute, that third party might be um, an arbitrator or a mediator, which is a flexible and not too formal process, or a very, very formal process, which involves the court. So what we have found is that when we study dispute resolution, we have tended to concentrate on the design of the dispute settlement system, the procedural aspects of the system, the substantive results that it produces, and whether parties comply with decisions that emanate from that process. Now, all of these aspects of the dispute settlement system, they work together to produce results that disputants will either accept or reject. We define a successful dispute settlement system as one that we consider to be legitimate and effective, two primary things, legitimacy and effectiveness. And those two concepts are inter interrelated. Legitimacy comes from the institution and the process that you create in that system, its procedures and the results that you see um, as an outcome from that system. So if disputants recognize this system as being appropriate for resolving their conflict, or they believe the system operates fairly, then um, they begin to accept that it's legitimate. In that case, the system will play a role in resolving that conflict, and, and the decisions that emanate from it will largely be complied with. Effectiveness, on the other hand, can be guided by examining the substance of the decisions that the system produces, as well as the consequences of those decisions. The question is, do those decisions fully answer the questions posed by the disputants? Do the decisions build the rule of law? Do the systems have a mechanism for enforcing its decisions? And are those decisions followed and the results internalized? So a system which commands a yes answer to all these questions is one which we then say effectively resolves the dispute for the disputing parties and the organization or whatever um, entity is involved in that dispute. But in speaking about this, we have not taken consideration of the economic impact of that dispute resolution process. All we have talked about is procedures, processes, and outcomes. So when we look at uh, legal institutions, we now have to begin to think more and more about economic growth and how they contribute to economic growth, because it is now a relatively well accepted principle in, within the economic uh, profession that dispute resolution is a significant factor in the way that an economy or a proper economy functions. And this can be demonstrated um, empirically. So we see the role of the judiciary, for instance, as setting up a framework in which you can bargain for property rights, and that bargain follows predetermined rules, provides a clear and quick decision in cases of doubt, and gives you a roadmap to the enforcement of rights, which is very, very important for decisions that you make in relation to contractual arrangements, investment decisions, and future economic activities of every participant in the economy. So that is why dispute resolution is of paramount importance in any economy. And that is why we have to talk about the economics of dispute resolution. Because we talk about this every day as mediators. We talk about delay. Mohammed talked about delay. The reality is disputes are damaging, they're expensive, they're time consuming. They affect individuals, they affect communities, organizations, government. So preventing disputes and resolving disputes early and more effectively essentially benefits the economy. 
And so pausing there for a moment, because the topic asks the question, is cost the only factor? I think you will begin to see that what, where I'm driving to is the fact that cost is in fact not the only factor. And by cost, I suppose you meant the cost that a disputant would have to pay to resolve the dispute. And when we look at it superficially, we think that that cost is perhaps only the legal fees that you pay to your lawyers um, or the court fees that you pay to court or the fees that you pay to the um, arbitrator or the mediator. Uh, that in totality might be the cost that we think on a prima facie basis is the cost of resolving that dispute. The reality is that it is not because unresolved conflicts and substandard dispute resolution is socially and financially costly. The full cost of these types of disputes to government, to parties, society are quite considerable and they are in fact a significant impediment uh, to economic prosperity. So when we think about the fulcrum of these costs, I think you will agree with me that delay is the very first issue that we must give consideration to. Because delays to adjudication come with a significant cost. And I will try to illustrate. So for instance, during the period required to resolve a dispute, there are resources at issue between those disputants which are essentially removed from circulation. So when a litigation, for instance, or an arbitration or a mediation, when it takes long to resolve, those resources remain unavailable in the sense that neither party can count on receiving them or putting them to use. So for instance, if there's a dispute between a supplier and a purchaser in which the supplier claims that the purchaser owes a million shillings, this leaves both the supplier and the purchaser uncertain as to which party will retain the funds after the dispute has been adjusted. So the purchaser can't comfortably invest their million shillings to hire new employees, for instance, because he or she or it is always thinking I might be required to pay the supplier once the dispute has been adjudicated upon. Likewise, the supplier cannot use the funds to purchase new equip equipment, for instance, because it may never receive the money. So both parties are constrained. The funds are unavailable to either of them. Both parties experience a loss until the dispute is resolved. So other things being equal, the greater the amount at issue, the greater the loss associated with the delay. So that it becomes oftentimes impossible, in fact, to calculate the direct economic cost of delays to adjudication of disputes. We talk about judicial slowness, which reduce incentives to start business because they deteriorate the security of property rights. So if you have bought a piece of land uh, for argument's sake, and you want to develop that piece of land, and there's a challenge to your title, or there's a, a, a second buyer, both of you remain in limbo until the judicial process is able resolve that issue. So essentially what has happened is that there has been a significant erosion and deterioration of your security over those property rights. You cannot charge the property, you cannot unsell it, you cannot build your house on it, you cannot invest anything in it until that dispute has been resolved. And that dispute when we think through our legal system, could take decades. So for instance, if you start at the magistrate's court, and then you move on to the high court, and then you move on to the court of appeal, 
you can see how um, that entire process um, could, uh, could lead to a uh, significant erosion in, in, in what you thought was an investment that you were making. So finding ways to speed up resolution of disputes then becomes fundamental to economic growth. There is an insecurity created by a weak judiciary because it changes economic behavior in two ways. First, the overall cost structure of the economy increases because increased collateral is required to make up for the risk which is associated with the poor performance of property rights. And therefore, there is an increase in consumer prices because if you have to um, put up more collateral, for instance, to, um, to fund the purchase of land, or to fund um, the acquisition of a loan, uh, to purchase a, a factory, inevitably the products that you produce from that factory um, will be higher. So consumer prices go up. Secondly, not all risk can be covered by a higher premium. So therefore, if the risk is considered to be too high, certain transactions simply will not take place. So an investor coming to Kenya, for instance, who wants to invest, may take a look at Kenya, take a look at the environment, its dispute resolution process, and the risk is too high, and therefore will divert that investment, say, to Rwanda, because Rwanda might be perceived to have a more efficient, um, more efficient dispute resolution system. So therefore, it must be understood that the presence of this uncertainty makes businesses less prone to invest, to expand their operations, and can even constrain the availability of capital for investment in business activities. Also, when entities engage in litigation, they are deprived of resources and funds that otherwise would have been available for investment in something more productive. So therefore, the inability to access these funds and resources can be thought of as the opportunity cost of delayed adjudication. So that today, dispute resolution calls for mechanisms which combine efficiency and fairness and also meet both the need to come to a conclusion of a dispute at hand and the equally important need to nurture rather than to poison ongoing business relationships. And so therefore, this leads me to the, the need to take a look at the mechanisms for dispute resolution that are available to us. As you know, um, first and foremost, is litigation because litigation is what is considered to be mainstream. Even though studies have shown that in fact, there are thousands of disputes resolved every day outside our mainstream uh, dispute resolution processes. Outside of litigation, there is then what we call ADR and ADR refers to alternative dispute resolution and as Sarah correctly said, um, appropriate um, dispute resolution, and I prefer the reference to appropriate. And this refers to any mode of dispute resolution that does not utilize the court system. So again, arbitration, um, conciliation, mediation, neutral assessment. These methods of ADR are different one, from one another, but they, they share certain common points. Um, the most notable is the fact that a third party is involved and a less formal and complex framework is involved than what you find in the court process. So essentially the third party offers an opinion about the dispute um, or you can either offer an opinion or give a binding decision, as you know. So therefore, you will be aware that in recent times, many, many countries are now beginning to adopt rules which require parties to go through some form of ADR before resorting to the court process. So for instance, we now in Kenya have the court annexed mediation program. Now, what 
parties may hope to withdraw from ADR in terms of benefit is time and costs. That's what parties hope that they are going to benefit from the ADR uh, mechanism. The judiciary, on the other hand, has a different uh, benefit that it sees because the benefit that it sees is to relieve the congestion in the courts by providing new methods of dispute resolution to meet the increasing demands for justice. Because as you know, the court process is, is, um, is slow, um, antiquated, and does not produce results that would enable any economy to operate robustly. Now, as, as with um, any situation, I think when we look at real life examples, then it is much easier to be able to actually fully appreciate the impact or the effect of what I'm saying about delay, about relieving um, congestion in the court uh, system, and about the benefits that parties look for in ADR. And so I, I just want to go through some stories. The first story that I think um, is, is illustrative in this case, and I'm certain that all of you must have seen the headline in the Business Daily last week, was this headline that, that, that said, Attorney General's office moves to seize SK Masharia's properties. Huh? I think you will all remember that. Now, what was the issue here? The issue here was that a bankruptcy petition had been filed against SK Masharia, whom we all know to be a wealthy businessman. Now, this was in relation to an amount of 500,000 shillings, which he was supposed to have paid back in respect of a disputed piece of land which he was seeking to buy 34 years ago. Now, over that period, this issue has been litigated from the High Court to the Court of Appeal. And what has happened is that this 500,000 amount, which was in respect of a disputed um, agreement for sale over a piece of land, has now grown to 293 million shillings. The effect of that is that SK Masharia has now been declared bankrupt. And the official receiver has been appointed to supervise his estate. So the official receiver will now essentially take over uh, the estate of SK Masharia, um, will prepare a statement of affairs, detail all his assets and liabilities with a view to settling them. Uh, this essentially means that Mr. Masharia will lose access to his businesses, his bank accounts, and his property will be under the watch of the receiver. He will also lose his direct directorships in companies that he or his wife own, including, as you know, his flagship Royal Media Services, which owns Citizen TV, as well as uh, several vernacular radio stations. Um, and creditors will be invited to come in and to um, to put in their, their claims over the estate. So certainly as a right of appeal, but the point I am making is that if you think about it, if an ADR process had been employed 34 years ago, or if there had been a speedier resolution to this dispute relating to a sum of 500,000 shillings, which may not have been an insignificant amount um, 34 years ago, but you can see the impact today, which is essentially to bring down an empire that a businessman has worked his entire life to create. 
either because he did not avail himself of a dispute resolution process that gave him more certainty as to what the outcome might be, or he did not take advice that may have said to him, find another way, which may speak to the quality of legal services that he employed. And so you will begin to see here that this goes so, so far be beyond costs. It is not the cost that he has paid to his lawyers. It is not the cost that he has paid to, um, to the courts through the years um, in, in litigating this. It is the cost to him personally in losing his entire investment or built over a period of, um, built over a lifetime essentially. And so um, you can see the, the impact of that. Now, I want to juxtapose that with another situation in which I have been involved. 15 years ago, I acted, I was approached by a company, and this company was in a relationship with another company. They, they had contracted to enter into a joint venture. And a dispute arose between them in relation to their commercial activities. Now, what happened is that one aspect of the conflict fortunately was governed by a contract which arbitration provision. And so we went to arbitration on that. But there was also a dispute relating to other general things which was not governed by any arbitration process. And so therefore, we could not go to arbitration on it and we had to go to litigation. So essentially, we ran two separate processes 15 years ago. The arbitration took us one year to uh, resolve. I'm happy to say that we were successful. Um, the, other, the, the other party did not challenge the outcome of the arbitration and paid off uh, my client the arbitration award, all in the space of one year. The litigation on the other hand, has gone back and forth for 15 years, and we finally got a judgment last year. With judgment again was in favor of my client. But it didn't stop there. Now, what happened was that the judge before whom the matter had been had was going on transfer. And I believe that in his anxiety to deliver the judgment, he did not give notice to any of the parties that judgment was going to be delivered. So he read the judgment, packed his files and moved to his news station. Meanwhile, both parties were waiting for notice relating to the judgment. Eight months later, we learn that the judgment was delivered. So, we take the judgment, it is in our favor, so obviously our client is happy. But the other party has now filed an application in court and says, listen, we got no notice of the judgment, therefore we had no opportunity to determine whether or not we wanted to appeal this decision. We have been prejudiced and therefore we would like this case had afresh by a new judge because our right of appeal has run out. And now we are fighting over this issue as to whether the judge should be, the judgment should be enforced or not because the judge who delivered it did not give notice to the parties that the judgment had been delivered. What is the point I'm making? The point I'm making is two companies doing business with each other in the same sphere, having disputes between themselves were able through arbitration within a year to resolve one dispute, but has taken them 15 years to resolve a separate dispute, which is still raging in court. So that tells you the difference between the efficiency of the two dispute resolution mechanisms. There's another story I like to tell. 
um, which again is in the public domain. And this is, um, you would all be um, aware of a company called Acon. Went into litigation, and I'll be very brief about the facts, with the Britam Insurance because they had been engaged by Britam to undertake and manage the development of Britam's properties. Um, when a conflict arose, Britam um, went and filed suit, alleged that Acorn had uh, withheld money improperly and so, so on and so forth, obtained an order freezing Acorn's um, accounts, and essentially completely um, brought to a halt Acorn's business. And so we had to make the decision whether to press on with the litigation, which we were confident we would be successful in, but we would emerge with a shell at the end of that litigation, or whether to try and negotiate a resolution. After much persuading, I was able to get um, my clients, Acon, to agree to negotiate. We negotiated, they were able to settle satisfactorily, and today you will all be aware that at the beginning of this year, Acorn were being celebrated launching a green bond on the London Stock Exchange. Because we were able to free them of the strictures and constraints of litigation that would have tied them down for years and years and years, and they would never have been able to achieve the success that they are now able to achieve because they have been able to release the resources, including the intellectual resources, which is required to think through um, products, um, innovative solutions, and so on, uh, in order to be able to launch on something like the London Stock Exchange. So those tell you what the true cost of delay in conflict resolution could potentially be. But the cost is not limited to money because when we think about cost, we often think about money. When we think about the economy, we often limit ourselves only to money, but there is a huge societal impact that bears the brunt of inefficiencies in the justice system. So you, you will be aware that three years ago, um, all the doctors in Kenya went on strike. <clears throat> and they, the strike went on and on and on. And meanwhile, um, the Ministry of Health, the government had gone to court and had obtained an order uh, declaring that strike illegal. And the doctors refused to relent. They, they insisted that they were going to go ahead with the strike. <clears throat> and as the strike wore on, you will remember the suffering that Kenyans were subjected to. Um, people going to hospital, not being able to access medical services because there were no doctors available. Um, there were deaths. People lost loved ones. And there was significant societal um, injury as a result of that strike. Beyond that, because the doctors had refused to comply, you will remember that the government applied to commit the officials of the doctors' union to jail for disobedience of a court order. And they were sent to committee and to um, Langata prison. So again, there was the loss of liberty for these doctors. That was the cost to them of going on strike. How was the strike resolved eventually? Eventually, the court very wisely and, um, um, and, and in a groundbreaking decision, the Court of Appeal allowed the matter to go to mediation. And I was fortunate to be one of the mediators who was asked to uh, mediate this uh, strike, you know, this dispute. Eventually, through our mediation efforts, uh, the government and the doctors were able to sign a recognition agreement, a return to work formula, and they returned to work. And they returned to work about a month after the mediation efforts 
um, had begun, had been launched. This was after more than 100 days of going between the courts, the doctors camping at Uhuru Park, and the suffering that was going on countrywide. So again, um, the ability to bring in a dispute resolution mechanism that would properly address the grievances of the parties, that would balance their bargaining power, and that would free them to go back to their respective economic activities. So that is why today I commend ADR to anybody that I have the opportunities to speak with. You see, when we think about costs, parties who use the, cost, cost, the court system, they do not actually meet the full costs of the public service that is rendered to them because they assume that when they come to ADR, they are going to meet the arbitrator's cost, their lawyer's cost, and therefore that, that, that is the cost that they are meeting without recognizing that there is a hidden cost in the public service that is offered by the court system. So therefore, when we compare costs, ADR may appear to be more expensive than the court system viewed on an individual user basis. But when you view it on a societal impact basis, you can then see that the court system is much, much more expensive. So the benefit of ADR is that it is responsive to the needs of the parties. It is more flexible, less formality. To those who desire it, it gives privacy and confidentiality. Um, where there are specialized disputes, it enables you to access that expertise so that you have specialized and innovative solutions. There's greater participant involvement and therefore empowerment. And more than that, there is early resolution. And so therefore, you can hopefully achieve faster outcomes and actually and parties, I dare say, are more likely to be satisfied with the result and compliance rates, and their uh, uh, compliance rates are likely to be higher so that less enforcement would be required. So it is for this reason that economists are interested in ADR. Two primary reasons. They're interested in ADR from one, one what we call an ex post perspective. That is the manner in which disputes are resolved or decided in society, which um, affects the operation of the legal system and its cost efficiency. And then from the ex ante perspective, that is the manner in which rights are vindicated, which impacts primary behavior and investments in prospective dispute avoidance. So with ex ante ADR, you can use ADR before a dispute arises so that you anticipate that a dispute will arise and you provide in your contractual arrangement that should a dispute arise, you will use an ADR mechanism. Ex post ADR refers to the use of ADR once the dispute has arisen. So that when the dispute has arisen, if you had not previously provided a mechanism, you are still at liberty to confer with the other disputing party and agree that given the nature of our dispute, we would like to invoke or activate an ADR mechanism. That is the flexibility that it gives you. Now, in my view, ADR or ex ante ADR may also act as a quality signal. So you will be aware that in many contractual relationships which offer high quality products, more often than not, the high quality or um, high value contractual relationship 
will offer an, an arbitration clause, for instance. And that serves as a quality signal because the high quality seller, the high quality pr producer will recognize that arbitration is a high quality dispute resolution mechanism and therefore insert it in their contract because thought has gone into how a dispute will be resolved when and if it arises. On the other hand, with relatively low quality products or low quality contractual engagements, you will find no provision for an ADR mechanism in the event of a dispute arising. And so therefore, the parties are left to their own devices when a dispute arises. And so ADR and its use will point you to the quality of the relationship that you will be going into. Mediation in a contract may also be a signal to you. So it may give you information about the other party. So if I am negotiating a contract and I insert a mediation clause in the contract and the other party is opposed to mediation and rejects mediation, for me, that is interpreted as a negative signal as to how this party wishes to approach this relationship. Because if a party wishes to approach a relationship and to maintain a relationship in a high quality or one that will be consensual and carried out in good faith, then I cannot see why they would be opposed to mediation as part of the dispute resolution mechanism. And therefore, it becomes the point at which you say to your client, or if it is you who is the contracting party, be wary of this relationship because the offer of mediation has been rejected right at the outset. Also, even though we are able to define the different ADR mechanisms, the reality is we are always trying to create new alternatives as ways to um, produce flexible and original solutions to dispute resolutions or to allow parties to design them for themselves. Now, very briefly, um, because I see it is coming to almost three o'clock and perhaps there might be questions, the other cost that we don't like to talk about is the cost of integrity in the dispute resolution process. And when we look at the dispute resolution processes available to us, more often than not, I'm certain that if I took a poll, the public service offering may be viewed as one that has less integrity than the private or the ADR offering. This is because with the ADR offering, you have the ability to choose your forum, your dispute res resolver, to be able to do a background check if you want to. And in any event, your dispute resolver would want to put him or herself out as one who carries integrity because that is the way in which you attract the market. The public service offering, on the other hand, is an institution that does not need necessarily to respond to you in that way because as a judge i am guaranteed a salary um, i have no choice as to who comes before me or the number of cases or na nature of cases that come before me and it is essentially left to my conscience and of course of course the strictures that we put in place um, now they are tighter and tighter uh, to 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 get me to uh, ensure that the way that I approach uh, the dispute resol resolution process and my, um, my role in it as one which exhibits integrity. And, and that is an entirely different study in terms of the impact of integrity or a lack of it to the cost and the economics of dispute resolution. Uh, and I, I think that it is sufficient for me to say that.
So I just want to close by saying that business disputes, commercial relationships, whether at domestic or international level, are best suited for ADR, except perhaps where state inter intervention is involved. Because ADR is more responsive, ADR um, certainly would take into greater consideration consciously or unconsciously its impact on both the economic and social implications of the way in which it functions. So therefore, to cost is certainly not the only factor. Cost is in fact a very, very small factor. And what we would like to do eventually is to put the decision making for parties in dispute in the hands of the actual parties who are in dispute so that they can resolve it themselves in the way that they deem best at a cost that is comfortable to them and one that they can see plainly um, without having to second guess what the eventual cost to them may, may be. Thank you very much for your attention and it was really a pleasure speaking with you. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ohaka. Uh, that has been uh, uh, quite thought provoking. Uh, we do have uh, a few questions. Uh, I perhaps will uh, just begin by, you know, asking your thoughts uh, about uh, mediation as, you know, one of the ADR uh, processes that there are. What, what are your thoughts about mediation and its uptake? Do you think the uptake of mediation in the country has been good? Uh, what can be done and should be done uh, to make this uh, one of the more preferred options? So you can take that and then uh, I'll give you some more as we go along. Um, so let me, let me um, start by saying that I have, with respect to mainstreaming mediation in, 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 in this country, I've been involved with it right from the outset. Um, uh, we, I sat in the task force that um, activated Section 59A of the Civil Procedure Act. Um, we designed the rules relating to quarter next mediation. We went through the pilot um, program, eventually started the mediation project at uh, Milimani Commercial Court, and then rolled it out into the other courts. And now mediation is, is, um, is essentially catching on. But from the, from the outset, it has always been my view that it is about a culture change. Culture change in the way in which we, um, we go about resolving our disputes. The reality is that as a society, our first thought has always been to go to litigation where there is a dispute. So yes, certainly um, there will be community um, mediation, uh, community uh, dispute resolution initiatives and so on that, that, um, uh, that operate in the background and that we never know about. But when we talk about mainstream dispute resolution, it is about culture change. And culture change happens over a long period of time. What I see now is culture change. One of the biggest impediments to the uptake of mediation, as you will have recognized from our various forums, was the legal fraternity itself. The legal fraternity viewed mediation as an impediment. In fact, um, viewed it as one that was um, unknown, one that would re result in declining revenues, one that um, there were no rules about. Uh, but Today, when I speak at uh, forums where we're discussing mediation, the room is full. There are lawyers willing 
take on mediation. I have chaired the um, Mediation Accreditation Committee. The, uh, the actual accreditation committee, both of the of MAC Mediation Accreditation Committee, as well as the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. And we now get applications um, in their thousands. In fact, we are overwhelmed with people wishing to take on mediation as mediators. And what is happening therefore is that there is a groundswell of a desire to go to mediation. Um, and I think that that is what culture change is about. That is what it will not happen overnight. Uh, certainly today, uh, do not rely on mediation for, um, as a mediation practitioner, don't rely on it as your sole source of revenue. And I don't know whether there are some of you here who do, but I would suggest that you don't. But I, I do know that in the fullness of time, uh, when we are able to commercialize mediation, as we will, a mediation will become a mainstream um, mechanism for dispute resolution. Very much like arbitration previously was. I remember 20 years ago, applying before a judge to take a matter to arbitration, and the judge rejected it. The judge said, why should I send you to arbitration for a private party um, whom, whose expertise I have no knowledge of, um, we don't know what outcome we will get from there. The judge was very suspicious of arbitration. As we know, many, many um, jurisdictions have shown us that uh, arbitration started off on that footing. Today, arbitration is, uh, is, is, is mainstream. I started off my morning this morning by having a preliminary meeting for a new arbitration that I'm taking on. And half of my portfolio today is arbitration. So, the point I'm making is that uh, once we achieve this culture change and once society begins to recognize the benefits, the value, and the, the cost vis-a-vis -vis litigation of mediation, um, uh, there will be significant uptake. Um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have uh, uh, Wangaria will be able to um, take us through a few questions uh, in just a little while, but uh, perhaps before that, uh, an another question for you, Mr. Uh, Ohaga. Yes. Um, how important is it for mediators to get onto different uh, panels, uh, seeing from your own self, uh, on, uh, you know, on different panels? How important? is it for mediators to get on different panels? And uh, what uh, advice would you give, you know, a mediator who's just starting out, uh, or how should they go about uh, getting onto the different panels? Uh, interesting question. I think it is about, it is about your ability as a mediator. You must be user friendly. Um, are you approachable when parties come before you? Do they feel confident that you have the tools to help them to resolve their dispute? Because the reality is that you can list yourself on a thousand panels and not get a single mediation. Because there is choice and that essentially is is what the free market is about. As a mediator, as an arbitrator, you are in the marketplace. You know, unlike a judge, a judge walks into his courtroom every morning with a course list, and the course list has matters that will be listed before that judge. The judge has no input into it. Um, the judge sometimes has no pre-knowledge as to who are coming before him, the nature of their cases, and so on and so forth. So the judge really has no real uh, other than for his own progression as, as a judge through the, um, the hierarchy of courts, has no real incentive to be attractive to the parties. But as a mediator, you have to sell yourself. And I don't mean go on TV and have ads. I mean, you have to build your brand. Your reputation is what sells. And so, 
you will therefore find that, in fact, when you have built that brand, you have no need to go looking for panels. They will come looking for you because your brand is, is, is out there. I, I always say, you know, we, we, there's often um, a lot made of how many lawyers we are churning out today and the fact that um, there's no space in the legal service market. I always say there's, there's always room at the top. You know? There's fresh air, it's clean. Um, it's at the bottom where you're, you have to struggle to breathe because there's so many of you um, that you would probably catch COVID down there. But when you find your way and are able to get some fresh air, you will find that the, the, the panels will come looking for you. So the point I think is, it is your responsibility as a mediator to develop your skill, to train yourself, to make yourself attractive as possible to parties, as I said, user-friendly, and word of mouth is a very, very powerful uh, marketing tool. Uh, it will come looking for you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for that. I'll uh, ask uh, uh, Wangari to be able to take us through uh, 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 another set of questions. Uh, Wangari? Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Ohaga. Today, and it's a delight to see you and uh, welcome, Mrs. Ohaga. Thank you for bringing the family over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Agari. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, and it's, yeah, it's really great to see you. And I, I want to thank you on behalf of the uh, colleagues, uh, those on the call, and those who will be uh, listening to the recording as uh, practitioners, because um, when we were having this session put together, the question was who sits across? anywhere you are trying to get through to or into. And uh, I think now you, you get to probably see that you, uh, you determine yourself, um, considering that you sit at uh, critical, uh, you have critical dockets or responsibilities that um, influence or even affect uh, mediation practice uh, in Kenya. So um, uh, we'll run through with you a couple of uh, comments and uh, questions that did come through from colleagues. And uh, we, well, some of them you have highlighted on them, so it'd probably just be an opportunity for either emphasis or just to clarify for us, uh, because um, as you said, um, there is a place where people are sitting and there's a lot of um, COVID, even probably manufacturing it, and you say that at the top there, really, <laughs> that's why, just as it's always is, at the top is where, you know, the, yeah, the air is always fresher and uh, it's, a, it's probably also about uh, positioning. So as uh, indicated um, in uh, the starting, that um, our focus is on ABR tomorrow, which is on positioning, policy, and practice. And yeah. here we are talking about reimagining, uh, retooling, and it's part of the discussion. As we're having these discussions um, uh, from, from March, where we've been virtual, uh, before that we've been having physical sessions, and as we lead towards um, our annual uh, strategy conference, and also um, the, our inaugural um, Africa International Mediation Week. So next, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll probably either, uh, raise a comment or um, a question, and then I will uh, request you to either respond to it, or uh, it's really just a comment and we can be able to um, um, uh, just receive it. Eh? Yes. So uh, firstly, um, in the, the responses from colleagues, there's a very resounding um, statement that mediation is not flying. And really that uh, Kenyans and the country is not receiving the true benefits. Uh, various uh, entities or parties or persons are seen as, you know, they're the ones who, and, and I think here is now probably when you are changes, you know, when they sit on the envelope and yeah, someone is sitting on, 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 on your connection to the headmaster, and uh, or to the sports, or to the yes, yes, let me yes, to the rugby captain, and so someone does not want you to be seen. You know, they always make sure you're the one who's being sent for water, and you know you're never put really at the. At the I mean, you're never really put um, at the uh, uh, with football. You're never really put on the pitch, 
And so there's a very strong experience by mediators that yes, they are being invited and they are invited and sit at the periphery and be happy and comfortable. So the, the key question that is there or, or comment or experience is, has mediation and the myriad benefits that would be available to Kenyans and to Kenya been hijacked and specifically by the state, courts, corporates, advisors, and multiple practitioners? You have told us yourself that uh, mediation has all these benefits and even other um, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Every single chief executive officer has financial metrics as part of what they should show back. And I think that's very relevant to this discussion here where we're talking about economics. And for most of the time when you talk about economics, we, we, we hear money or thinking about money. They have metrics, if it's a human resource person, you have metrics that relate to people. What's the level of attrition? But however, we are not seeing these uh, uh, chief executive officers chief financial officers, you know, running for mediators. So the question then that comes in, where has it been hijacked? Or really, is it that it is just a nice thing to say that we have um, in the country? I will move on uh, to the next uh, uh, part. And so that was, that, that is an inquisition um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, for you to keep at the back of the mind because it forms the basis of the next uh, set of um, inquiries that we have. So we have attendees uh, uh, from across Kenya, Nakuru, Eldoret, Nairobi, Mombasa, yes, and we have uh, from the UK, and the, um, our attendees are 98% as mediators. And um, so for this part, uh, the first, the question that um, we had was, in your opinion, in the dispute ecosystem, which stakeholder or person or persons or entities is the most important? So we got a myriad of um, uh, responses, the facilitator, lawyers, mediators, dispute resolver, judges, courts, legislators, all stakeholders and disputants was, was probably coming from about just 30% of the responses as that person being the most important. So in your opinion, these stakeholders, do they use mediation effectively? There was a resounding no. So that said, then we are probably asking ourselves as we move on now to the next um, uh, uh, descriptions. We have a great, uh, in, the, um, in the next slide, uh, we have a great game that is known as uh, the running dinosaur game. And uh, the running dinosaur great game, you, it's quite popular because you run and then you jump and you know, you're, it's hurdles, hurdles, hurdles. And so here we have very specific questions for you. And we are looking at, in the development of an enriching mediation and dispute resolution practice in Kenya. So what boundaries specifically exist for the practice of mediation as a dispute resolution practice in Kenya? Then in addition to that, what boundaries must mediators push? On the other side, sometimes you can work on collaboration. What collaborative efforts would be required and all this is so that mediation can thrive in Kenya. That said, we have other mechanisms, just as you've pointed out, negotiation, conciliation, arbitration, expert evaluation, which make the whole um, dispute, uh, resolution uh, dispute resolution sector on the appropriate dispute resolution mechanism. So even when we come down to the other mechanisms, what's required for them to thrive? So probably with that introduction, we can start there. What's the dinosaur we are dealing with? Thank you, Mr. Ohaga. Okay, so um, can I, you've asked me several questions. Yes, yes. I think it's helpful for me before I start to answer your questions to ask you a question. I, I, I get, I'm on your mailing list. I get um, your mail every, and they're very, they're, they're very frequent, very exciting topics, um, and, and, and clearly there is a lot of interaction that is going on within the mediation community with respect to mediation. How much interaction do you have with the market? 
Are you just talking to yourselves? Because the reality is, Wangari, I mean, how frequently is Sarah going to have a dispute that you, she will call you to? So what are the efforts that you are making to interact with the market? To be out there and to say we are here and this is what we do, this is what we can do, and this is how we can do it. Because it is very, very important to appreciate that eventually to break away from the constraints that you feel now, because I understand, I understand essentially what you're saying. The constraints that you feel now is perhaps through the quota next mediation system, choices of mediators, and I hear these complaints all the time. Maybe they are favored mediators, maybe some who never receive work and so on. But essentially what, what you are, is what you're saying is that I am at the end of this pipeline waiting for something to come down and it isn't coming. Yeah. So you might be, let me find an example that just comes to my mind. Uh, so if, 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 um, you have this single source that you're looking at to spur or to spark the growth of mediation. But there has to be much more work that needs to, 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 to take place. And that, that work is in cultivating the market. Have you reached out to uh, financial institutions and said, we are setting up a forum for you to educate you on mediation, tell you what we can do. Certainly, the first time you hold it, you might have only two legal officers attend, I can tell you. The second time, four might show up. The third time, you know, and it will increase exponentially. So my, in my view, I think you need to engage with the market. I think you need to be um, more, um, more interactive. You need to recognize that this is a business. You're in business and you have to sell yourself. And, and therefore, uh, you cannot be continually only engaging in uh, this incestuous relationship where it is just yourselves talking to each other. You have to find a way to free yourself of the court annexed mediation program. Use it as a platform, but free yourselves from it. Because mediation will truly take off when I don't need to go through the court annexed mediation system to have parties come to me to, um, as a mediator. I, they come to me independently of that system, and therefore my, um, my flow of work is not dependent on the mediation registrar picking and choosing and sending me work, or is not dependent on the fact that there is a claimant who perhaps is happy to go to mediation in the hope that uh, the dispute will, will be resolved quickly, but there is a defendant who is buying as much time as possible and therefore will try to do everything possible not to settle in the mediation process. I'll tell you though, just to give you hope, because I know that sometimes we sit there and we think there is nothing happening. In January of this year, <coughs> the, the governor of the central bank uh, contacted me and said he wanted to mainstream mediation in the banking sector. And he therefore wanted to arrange a forum which was to be attended by chief executives and top officials in the banking sector. And he, as regulator, would ensure that they attended. For that reason, he had invited um, 
as an American lady, she was a former judge, she's a mediator now, but she's been here before, speak on mediation. And so there was going to be her, um, we were going to get um, 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 Stuart, you know Stuart, UK mediation trainer, to come in as well, and then we were going to have a local speaker. And he wanted me to moderate it. And I said, perfect, because that was the platform that mediation required. We scheduled that for um, end of February. The week before they were due to come, they all canceled because of COVID. So unfortunately, we could not go ahead with that forum. But the forum was, was planned. The point I'm making is this, is by the time the governor of the central bank takes an interest in mediation and takes the trouble himself to arrange a forum in which he will ensure that those he regulates, the top executives, will attend that forum so that they can sensitize themselves to mediation, it tells you that he has recognized its value. And so, Hopefully, when we are done with, the, with, with COVID, we can find ways to, um, to pick that up again. I think mediation is like the story of the, the um, you know, they normally draw this thing of all the iceberg under the water and uh, what you see at the top. And all the peddling that you do under the water, nobody sees it. And one day it emerges and we think, ooh, success story. But nobody really knew how much time and effort it took to get to where you are. And I think that it is really just a matter of keep plugging on, keep plugging, keep plugging, but also find different approaches. Find different approaches. I think that other than um, finding Finding, um, I, I see, for instance, many family re related, family business related forums being held. Um, do we go there and find out whether we can, we can participate as mediators? Because family business forums are, are rich um, environments to provide mediation services. Because yes, families may be in conflict in their businesses or even in their personal relationships, but nobody really wants that linen out public, what we see every day. Offer it to them, make it available to them. Make yourselves available at these forums um, and, and, and try, to, try to, you have to invest. You have to invest time. You have to invest your personal resources. I speak here, it's, it's fortunate that my wife is here, so um, it's, it's no secret that I am, I, between her and me, in terms of the way that I spend her money, I have taken myself from Nairobi, Kenya, to the Bahamas to speak on arbitration at my own cost, I have taken myself to Kuala Lumpur to speak on arbitration or to speak on the sports tribunal. It's the recognition that unless you invest, you will not get it back. So what are you doing to invest in yourself in brand Wangari? Kimutai, what, what, what are you doing yeah? to invest in yourself and therefore put yourself out there? Uh, social media, do you try to ignite the mediation fire in your social media platforms? Um, are, are, are you setting it alight? Are you setting the world alight? I think that those are things that you have to think about. Um, do you, I, I know that uh, Rupert, for instance, made a lot of effort to come and, and talk to uh, my dispute resolution teams at the farm uh, to talk to them about mediation. But, but Rupert, with respect with my farm, for instance, you're talking to the converted. 
Yeah. So you have to find virgin territory. Who are those people that you need to talk to who may not have heard the mediation message and who you can begin to, um, to influence? And it starts with that spark. And one day somebody will remember that, uh, that um, Tabitha spoke with me about mediation. Let me give her a call and find out whether she can take on this case. Those are the little things that you need to do in order to, um, to, to, keep, to keep going. Uh, with respect to boundaries, what boundaries exist for the practice of mediation? Uh, I'm not so sure, Wangari, what you mean by boundaries? If you can just elaborate so I, I understand the question. Okay. Yeah, yes. Uh, so firstly, I really thank you so much for um, your your message that speaks into someone who's building a profit, I mean, who's uh, building a practice. A practice is continuous. You add, you add, you add, and uh, you're able to be able to, in all that, accumulate and then now uh, 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 thrive or, be, uh, or build on that. Uh, with the question with regard to if there are any boundaries, it's as open as the word boundaries is. In Kenya here, are there boundaries for mediation? Are there boundaries for mediators? Are there any, uh, is, is, are there any that you see as, you know, you know, this is, you reach up to here and then that's the end? Um, I think the boundaries are boundaries that we create. Boundaries that, um, because we refuse to push the edges. You refuse to push beyond the boundaries. So, Great. so you're speaking, if I may, you're speaking then into the next part, which is, you know, what are those boundaries, artificial or real, that mediators must push, which also ties in probably what are those collaborative efforts that may be required to uh, work around uh, the real or artificial boundaries. Thanks. So boundaries might be, for instance, um, and I see a question here about enforceability of mediation agreements uh, and parties' willingness to, to um, parties' willingness to comply with mediation agreements. I see a question about. Um, that is willingness even to come to the mediation table. And for me, I think the, the, the thing is, what are you willing to do as mediator in order to ensure that you get the outcome that you want? What are you willing to do? Uh, when we were mediating the doctor's strike, there are many nights I came home at midnight. I came home at midnight because you would have a 10 o'clock start, 10 a.m., and the doctors would be there at 10 a.m., ready. The government functionaries come at noon. Now, you can throw your hands up in the air and say, you know, I don't have time for this. I'm out of here. This is not what I signed up for. Considering I was not being paid a single cent to undertake that mediation. But I sat through the mediations, waited with the doctors patiently, sat through caucused, one calls that needed to be made to state house in order to try and break impasses and so on, sometimes ending up midnight. In the end, that mediation was unsuccessful. It was unsuccessful. So the question was, did I spend all this time? Was it a waste of my time? And you can go away and think that you're a failure. But a week later, I got a call from the doctors and they said, we had three mediators. Now we want one mediator because we've been speaking with government. We want to resume the mediation effort. 
We don't want three mediators now, we want one, and we want you. Would you take this on? I thought about the time that I had spent with, with them previously. And I thought, do I really want to do this again? I suggested a cost, they pushed back. Eventually I said, okay, I, I'm gonna do it. And I did it and we, we eventually broke through and were successful. Once again, not a single shilling. I did not earn a single shilling from that. Hours and hours of mediation. So what I'm trying to say is that those barriers that you see, they may appear to be barriers, but I think that they are barriers if you allow them to be barriers. And, and I can't perceive of every barrier that you're thinking about or talking about. I can't perceive of them. You know, every day in your respective practices, you probably meet barriers. Doors closed in your face, um, people refusing to return your calls, um, parties, recalcitrant parties coming to mediation and not being cooperative and eventually uh, turning away. Those, those, those are barriers, mediation agreements that judges turn away because uh, you, you, you didn't do something right or that parties refuse to enforce. I think that those are just obstacles that you need to overcome. When we, um, I told you about the Acon case, when we decided that we were going to negotiate because we saw that the cost of litigation was going to be too high, we arranged lunch with the top executives of Britain. Um, and we were supposed to meet at the Capital Club. So I took my, my clients, chairman, CEO, financial con uh, CFO, went for lunch. We arrived at Capital Club and um, expecting to meet Mr. Wairegi, Mr. Munga, the top because that is what we had agreed. Who showed up? An assistant marketing manager, a PA, and some other, somebody that I can't even categorize. These are the people they sent for that meeting. So of course there was nothing to negotiate with them. And we said, you know, this is the, essentially, this is a slap in the face. They're essentially sticking their hands up at us. So we all, I persuaded my clients to just have their meal. We sat, we had our meal in silence and we all left. <clears throat> and I called up opposing counsel and I said, um, you let me down. Can we have this meeting again? And after we had discussed it, he said, okay, let's have the meeting. I will now bring the proper people. I called up my clients and I said, uh, they've agreed to have lunch with us again. And my client said, no way. We are not coming. After what we experienced, we are not coming. I said to them, listen, yeah, you and me have sat down. We have looked at the litigation pathway. We have seen the cost and where you will end up, even if, as I've assured you, we win this case. So you make up your mind. Do you wanna to come to this lunch or do you want to go down the litigation pathway? They came to their senses. They came to the lunch. This time the top leadership of the other party showed up. We had such an amazing conversation that in fact, they wanted to meet the very following day. Um, and the obstacle was the lawyer's diaries. We now couldn't meet, so we agreed to meet on the weekend. We met on the weekend, lunch, through dinner. They got drunk together. And um, after a while, fortunately, the conversation veered into Kikuyu and I had to leave because I was now being kept out of the dialogue. But the point I'm making is, what are barriers? 
Yeah? What are barriers? I, I think that if you're truly determined to make a success of yourself, you will just keep pushing those boundaries. You will keep pushing the boundaries until a door opens. And there's many times you'll find that you, what you thought was a wall is in fact a door and it will open. But you just have to keep pushing. I, I can't categorize those boundaries. Uh, what Gary, uh, um, you talk about collaboration, certainly collaboration is, is very, very important. Yeah? When, we, um, when we started the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, one of the things that we said we had to do was to get parties to insert NCIA into their contracts. And in order to do that, we then had to collaborate with different parties. Because when lawyers draw up contracts or parties draw up contracts, they will put in clauses that they are familiar with. So you need to collaborate with them. You need to um, sensitize them. You need to bring to their attention the fact that Nairobi Center exists. So by the same token, we must start to get commercial parties to build in arbitration into their contracts. So start off with arbitration, and if arbitration fails, go into, um, sorry, start off with mediation. If mediation fails, then go into arbitration. That way, then parties are forced to go to mediation. And when I talk about, I talked about high quality contracts, target those high quality contracts, yeah? So that disputing parties recognize that mediation is available to them and there are quality mediators available to them. Because the other obstacle that we often find is the market saying there are no quality mediators available, therefore mediation is not attractive. So you must ensure that you have quality mediators available and that therefore you're constantly showcasing your best. Because when you showcase your best, then there is a trickle down effect because, you know, essentially because of cost structures, your best may be able to get a certain category of work, but mediation has now become um, in vogue and others will also get the work that is available. So collaborate with the um, chambers of commerce, collaborate with the law firms, collaborate with the, anybody that you think has access to the marketplace. Um, as I, I talked about family mediation, collaborate with the FKE, Federation of um, Kenya Employers, collaborate with unions, Nobody truly wants to spend the time that they do in litigation, but they go there because they think that they have no option. Huh? Or they think that the other options that are available are unattractive for one reason or the other. Make it attractive. Package it. How do you make it attractive? You have to keep hammering at it until you find a breakthrough. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, as, as I mentioned that uh, when we were preparing for this particular session, the question was, who is that person who is um, left, right, horizontal, vertical in areas that uh, either mediators are uh, seeking to uh, get through to or areas where mediators may view that mediation uh, would actually work um, very, very well. So I would like to thank you for um, that um, very good uh, let me say a very good and very sharp uh, uh, summary, which actually is, you know, is like when you someone receives a sword, eh? you thought you were giving it to that friend. <laughs> it comes this way, and I really hope that um, it has given us as practitioners, you know, um, the, the lay of the lay of the ground and just the reality. It is not about boundaries. It's boulders, and you know, jump, you know, uh, 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 pass through and. And especially probably when we are together, then we are able to be able to advance this. Um, as mentioned earlier, ADR tomorrow is about reimagining, to rewire, and to retool in the practice um, of professional mediation. Um, as Wasilena 
uh, we are excited to be part of the development of professional mediation practices because we view mediation as a profession the way someone wakes up and goes to their engineering uh, practice, uh, someone that goes as a dentist, you go into your uh, dental farm, then that's really the vision that we see and we are delighted as um, uh, uh, mediators engaged with Wasiliana Hub. And we uh, do hope that um, the discussions that we have enable them to be able to, uh, let me say, get bolder to be able to take those steps. And for those who have already taken the steps that they are now able to have um, tactics and strategies that come from guests such as yourself, such as yourself. So the discussions that we are having, especially um, in, in, the last, um, uh, in the last half of the year, are leading us towards um, our strategy um, conference, which is which we refer to as the Strategy 2020 con Conference. Uh, we held the first one last year, and uh, it's a one day, and uh, we are looking forward to the next one, which is the, um, in the first week of December. And this year also, we have broadened to also uh, incorporate the African International Mediation Week. So taking the first week of December as an African International Mediation Week and then having various uh, uh, sessions, virtual, and some of them may actually go physical. Just one very specific question. Which one topic do you see is extremely relevant to be in the discussion at that, this forum that we are convening? So we are convening the African International Mediation Week. We have uh, speakers who are coming from um, across uh, Africa and also um, internationally. And also exciting, we also have colleagues uh, who are mediators in Kenya who are running talks and sessions. If, you were, uh, if we were to ask you, what one topic would you find quite useful or relevant that you can throw into the mix um, here for us? Thank you. Oh, OK. <laughs> Is the topic OK? <laughs> um, what, um, area, what, what area do you find relevant? Yeah, what area? Yeah. Um, actually, I would not. You, you probably are looking for an answer in the mediation technical competence area? I don't think so. I think that you really should be I'm asking, sure you should be asking yourselves, or you should be trying to address the, 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 the topic. Um, what skills does a mediator, what soft skills does a mediator require to be user friendly because when you come into a mediation i think if you don't have a connection with the parties then you, you don't even get started and the connection with the parties is not you know i know how to caucus or i know the i know how to draw a mediation agreement I know um, that you know this is where they have to sign, or I know um, how to summarize what uh, this party is saying. It, it isn't that. I think that first and foremost, you just have to connect. And I, I think connecting is a skill that can be learned. So, that's the topic that I think I would love to hear and talk okay. about. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. You've uh, just given us a, a topic for a time segment in the strategy conference on Friday that uh, we had just left and we had said we will ask this guest of ours, uh, what is that uh, one topic that we can insert in there? And don't be surprised if it kicks back at you, just the same with the sword of kicks back <laughs> on this other side. So I'd really like to thank you, Mr. John O'Haga, for um, yeah, just joining, uh, joining with us to those, um, those queries. Colleagues, um, I believe that as we have received those responses, they've helped us to uh, clarify us, uh, on some of the comments, some were there, uh, that are either in the chat or had been sent in earlier. Some are directed to specific institutions, and I believe that are related to specific institutions or uh, personas. And we believe that Mr. O'Haga's uh, comments have helped us just to um, round, it, round it off. 
And we're looking forward that when we engage again with yourself during the Africa International Mediation Week, when we'll have more time, we can be able to address some very specific areas, especially asking ourselves, how are we stepping out and how we stepped out into the market, which I believe is uh, what um, Mr. Ohaga has actually put back to us. Um, so, colleagues, uh, our quarter three mediation uh, day uh, symposium is uh, coming to close to an end as we look forward to our third session, which is uh, starting today at uh, 4 p.m. We started in the morning, and uh, uh, Mr. Ohaga, you uh, definitely you may, you'll be delighted to know that we started our morning session on, this, on emotional intelligence. And now, uh, uh, truly, um, in uh, having that discussion, really pointed out, you know, the soft skills we're talking about, there is mm -hmm. quite a lot that we uh, build in ourselves that helps us to be more effective, leave alone even the, the tools, the procedures that relate to the work. Um, and that was our morning session at 7 a.m. with uh, Mr. Derek Banga on uh, emotional intelligence, helping uh, mediation and dispute resolution practitioners to be able to understand uh, about their, their getting connected to their feelings and also feelings of um, other persons um, that they deal with. Um, so this is our uh, sundowner session and uh, we are with Mr. John Ohaga and our discussion uh, has been on the focus for the, this particular symposium, which is on the economics of uh, dispute in Kenya. We are getting into our sunset session as soon as uh, mediator Sarah Atel releases us and that's at 4 p.m. And we will be having Madam Nina Nkasa Mutegi, who's the director and chief executive officer of Mirema School and uh, Bibili Kolem Entrepreneur, Mirema School is an inclusive school, and uh, she will be speaking to us about Able Differently. And uh, this is uh, making mediation and dispute resolution accessible to persons with disabilities and uh, uh, persons with special needs. So we're looking forward, colleagues, to be with you in the next session um, in, a, in uh, just uh, less than uh, 10 minutes. So once again, uh, from my end, I thank you all for being with us. And Mr. Ohaga, we are delighted. Thank you for affording the time. Thank you for helping us to put together um, economics and the work that we do. And yes, please pass our regards to the family. And yes, as we give them a virtual hug, please um, add, add, add ours there. Moderator Sarah Terrell, thank you for uh, joining with us. And I send the uh, discussion back to Moderator Sarah Terrell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fungari. Thank you very much, everybody, for allowing me to have the privilege of speaking with you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. God bless. Um, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ohaga. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we have just uh, concluded our uh, session uh, this uh, afternoon, uh, looking at the economics of uh, uh, dispute in Kenya, uh, this uh, 15th day of uh, October 2020. Uh, we conclude uh, with the words of the national anthem uh, recited in uh, Kiswahili. E mungu, e mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwengao na mlinzi, na tukai na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. Once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ahaga. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I have been your moderator for this particular session, uh, mediator Sarah Atter. Thank you very much.